Gross profit is the difference between how much you make on a property and what you actually pay for it. So if you want to increase your profit per deal, you either have to increase your price to sell, which the market may or may not support, or you decrease the amount of money that you pay for the property. In this episode of the Land.MBA podcast, we're going to speak with Lucas King, who went from zero to six figures in his land business in less than six months. He's going to share with you how he shaved $4,000 off the purchase price of a property with this one simple technique. Welcome to the Land.MBA podcast, where we go deep into the business of land investing. What's going on, Lucas? So I told you about what I wanted in exchange for doing this. All right, fine. We're going to do a quick commercial for for Mr. King. He's in dire need of a pull-up bar because you can't get one because they're all bought up so that people can start getting in shape while they're sitting home bored in coronavirus. He's up in Maine. He's willing to pay a premium. So, and, and it's, it's he, he was willing to pay even extra if it comes with a pretty girl attached to it. So if you've got a pull-up bar that you just, just dead weight in your house, we have a buyer. Okay. You know, the problem is this probably won't air for a few weeks. We're gonna have to, so we're going to have to sneak time, the just this clip stopped. out on Facebook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and so, so in order to consummate this, we're going to have to put, you know, your, your, we're going to have to dox you. So your full address, telephone number, email will all go into the show notes. <laughs> hey, yeah. So, I, know. I live in a motel. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about your motel. You, you've got a sweet little situation set up. Well, I moved back from Thailand in November where I first started this business. And then I decided to get an off-season rental in Old Orchard Beach, Maine, which is quite a nice area. I'm even, I'm able to get out and walk down the beach even during quarantine. So I'm glad I'm in this place, but you know, it's just uh, built for my lifestyle, I guess. I'm always on the move. I have been since before I started this business. And that's just another benefit of, I guess, this whole lifestyle. So, so you, nice. okay. There's so much to unpack here. So, uh, pretty, pretty beach, but just so we can get it clear, this is Maine. So we're not like talking California, Sandy beaches or Florida, Sandy beaches, uh, that are just, you know, under normal conditions filled with all the beautiful people and whatnot. This is Maine. What is a Maine beach like? Well, old orchard beach is one of the few, big beaches in Maine that's like totally sand. All the rest of them are pretty rocky. So I'm at the best possible beach in Maine. There's some pretty girls out there. There's some horses, there's some dogs. So can't complain. <laughs> Sweet. Now, now this is a lifestyle you've been doing since before land. So what did you do before land that allowed you to live a similar kind of, uh, what's the word, uh, the, the, the wanderer kind of lifestyle? Uh, well, <sighs> For my entire, ever since I graduated university, I'm almost 40 now. So I uh, have been living abroad, basically traveling around. And at one point I started an Amazon business and it got to be pretty big to the point where I sold it. And then I had a little mini retirement in Thailand and I finally found this and I'm back on, I'm back on track making loot. Loot. <laughs> See, for the non land investors listening to this podcast, you're going to loot. Okay. I mean, just this, this image of black and white striped suits and, you know, masks and whatnot. <laughs> it's just about that easy, isn't it, Howard? It is. It's like robbing a bank, you know, with no security. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Dave, you're up. What are, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about. Um, Luke's uh, success and and uh, his journey in land investing, and uh, he's going to teach us the hacks that he's learned and how to shave money off deals. Cool. So, so Luke, oh, you started this what about six months ago? You started your business? No, I got coaching from Dave starting last June, but I didn't buy my first property until uh, September. So. 
about seven months ago since I actually bought a property. Okay. So, so you did a little bit of, of education first and then you bought a property and then it's sort of hockey sticked as they say. Yeah, that's about right. And, and the, the interest, so where, where, I mean, you don't have to give specifics like counties or anything, but whereabouts were you buying properties? Colorado. Okay. I mean, a lot of people do business in Colorado and yet it just seems like your trajectory has been faster and steeper than a lot of the people we hear from. Uh, what, what do you attribute that to? I would say that I bought some properties that were between five and 10,000 earlier and flipped those as quickly as I could. Actually, one of the first properties I bought, I bought for eight grand and sold for 17,000. And that was great at the time. I thought, wow, look, I just made this money. It was very easy and big profit margin. But looking back on it now, I probably could have sold that property for 40 grand. So there, <laughs> the, I guess just one of the takeaways is to just attack it. Don't be afraid to make mistakes and, you know, make money. You will make money. And that's, that's what I notice about you is you are, you are a man of action. You know, we, we've been on a lot of calls together, a lot of group calls. You, you're, you're, you're typically on the uh, land speed smart bar, which is our mastermind group. And, and, you know, you'll say, well, I, I'm going to do this because, you know, I want to get this property moved. And a bunch of people will jump on and say, well, I think that's pretty risky. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So initially these pro these first properties, even that one I just spoke about, I was selling to weed growers, hemp growers, and everybody was like hemming and hawing like, Oh, what about this? What about that? And actually, I mean, they probably had some good points, but it turned out all right. Actually, what I'm referring to is doing terms deals with these kind of people selling for cash. You know, there's no problem there, but yeah, that's kind of the attitude is move fast and break, break things, you know, like, Facebook says. So yeah, adopt that into your own life. I love and, it. And how beautiful is this business? If you, def if they default, you still, you win twice. <laughs> you know, just take it back and yeah, reset. I don't even know. That's what I, that's what I hope is the case. I hope there's no consequences that are floating around out there that I'm not aware of. You know, you don't know everything you don't know, but that seems to be the case. Yeah. Yeah, okay, but so you've been you you've, you've, you've been able to get big down payments for a lot of your properties, so you're you're pretty well protected there. And I mean, one of the things that has been fun about coaching you, Lucas, is that you do take action. I remember in the beginning, you know, we talked about all the business things that need to get set up. And just push those off. Let's get properties. Let's get the mail out. Let's get deals coming in. And you're like, yeah, sweet. And you didn't like set up a website right away and worry about setting up an LLC right away. You were, you focused on what you needed to do to get deals in the door. And I see a lot of people in this business. Um, and that's really how I try to, based on your success, I try to focus on that with my newer students, but, um, cause so many people are the, get the ready, aim, 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 aim mentality. And they take too long to get, really do what makes them money and they want to make sure everything else is perfect. Their website's perfect and they're, they got the right branding and LLC and it's like, no, get the mail in the air. Yeah, I think that's right. It's the way to go about it. Hey folks, my name is David Van Steenkist and I've been a real estate investor for over 10 years. I've used lots of different tools, but none of them has done for my business what Landspeed does. Landspeed covers every step in the land investing process from ordering mailing lists to marketing sales and closing the deal. What I really like though is it anticipates my needs. When I think, oh, I wish I had a quick and easy way to evaluate return on investment on a potential property, Look no further, Landspeed does it. If I want to edit a deed after Landspeed creates it, it can do that too. Most systems just stick you with a PDF that's uneditable and you got to go back into the system and edit the fields and do whatever you need to do and it's a real pain in the rear end. Landspeed simplifies it. If I want to send one or five or even 40 neighbor letters at the click of a button, bam, Landspeed does it. Um, but even with all that inherent capability, 
You get access to Landspeed Community, you get weekly mastermind calls, and you get the best mailing rates in the business with no volume commitment, which is freaking awesome. Because if I just want to pop one contract to somebody, I don't have to pay a buck and a half. I still pay the bargain basement rate. And on top of that, customer service is stellar, quick, and they just do a great job. I've been very, very happy, very pleased with it. Uh, and look, I've been running my business on land speed for over two years. So take it from me. If you're serious about your land business, then check out land speed at facebook.com slash land biz automation. That's land B I Z automation. And if you want a hundred bucks off, tell them you heard it from me, David Van Steenkist on the land.mba podcast. So, so I, I was kind of chunk people coming into this business into three buckets. There are people with very little business experience. There are people with corporate business experience. And then there are people with entrepreneurial experience. And you're clearly coming into that bucket with the entrepreneurial experience. And, 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 I, and I see that when I look at how you ma manage your business, that you manage it differently than people in those other two buckets. So mm -hmm. I, my question is, were there some things that, you know, business principles that you learned from your Amazon business or other entrepreneurial ventures that you brought and carried over into your land business? Yeah, tons. I didn't even really know where to begin because it's all kind of internet based business stuff. But um, yeah, just there's so much. I mean, beginning with something as small as an email list and knowing how to do that and set all that up and anything that has to do with selling on the internet, I definitely brought over to this business. But one thing that I do where I, I realize there is a difference between me and somebody who's uh, got corporate experience, like for one, I would never make it in a corporate business. I just hate that environment. I've gotten in trouble in jobs that I had that were corporate style. And um, one thing that, I believe that I do differently is people in those, those that come from that background seem to get everything in place in a very technical way and look at analytics and everything. And analytics are great, but I really just focus on the 20% of the work that I do that gets 80% of the results. So like the other day we were talking about how to get, how to really hit home all these Facebook ads that are uh, Facebook contacts that you're getting that are just piling up. And I said, like, well, what is the sense of banging your head against the wall all day, trying to curate them, talk to them, all these people who are very low percentage probability buyers, when you can just go out and hit the big stuff, like buy a Lands, Lands of America signature plan for 800 bucks, and that's going to get you way more exposure to way more people who are actually likely to buy I mean, that's, and that's not even a difference between me and somebody coming from the corporate background, but I think that the point I'm trying to drive home here is that I brought the same mentality of doing as little as possible to get the greatest return from my other business. Brilliant. You know, when I was in my very first duty station in the Marines, you know, I was a butter bar, second lieutenant. You never led Marines before. And now here I am. I've got this platoon of Marines. I got a bunch of staff NCOs, which are senior enlisted guys that have, you know, been there and for, you know, two decades. And, you know, and their their goal is really to train me in a lot of ways. And I had this staff sergeant and he was the funniest guy because he could barely string words together into a sentence that I could understand. I mean, <laughs> it was just, I'm like, I have no idea what you're trying to tell me right now, but he said this one thing to me, and it was the most impactful one sentence I think I learned in my entire time in the Marine Corps. He said, sir, they will tell you that 20 percent uh, that you're going to end up spending 80 percent of your time on the 20 percent troublemakers in your platoon. He said, I'm here to tell you, don't do that. Spend 80 percent of your time with the top 20 percent in your platoon. And don't worry about the rest because you're not going to change them. They're going to all filter out anyway. But if you put invest in what in, in those top 20%, you will be hugely successful. I've never forgotten that. 
Yeah, that's the Pareto principle at work. 80-20, exactly. man. Um, the, the other thing is, I, you know, I, I always think about there's a difference between being entrepreneurial and being an entrepreneur. And the difference is your willingness to take a risk. I mean, both of them, you know, you maybe you build business plans and, you know, you, and you go out and you go into, you, you figure out how to, uh, you know, find a new opportunity and penetrate a new market and bring a product to market. And, and I, I was always in that entrepreneurial camp because I was, I brought a lot of products to market, but I always did it within a large company. And the difference was I wasn't willing to take personally the risk to do it. It wasn't until I got into land that I became an entrepreneur and said, I'm willing to take on the risk. So, so tell me a little bit from your experience prior to land, how you manage risk and how you brought that into the land business. I always was willing to take the risk to, you know, grow my, grow myself, grow my opportunities, grow my savings. You know, like I came from a background where I was a teacher and I knew I was in a dead end and I needed to get out. So I saved up all the money I could and bet it all on internet business and it worked out. Um, so you really just got to look at it. Like I live once and let's do it big and let's do it, you know, let's do it right. But on the other hand, I also just seek out the lowest risk possible things I can do and really lower the risk and do it in a really, a way that I can't lose money. I mean, this is like one of the biggest things about our business is like, you'd have to really get, I mean, if you're careful about what you're buying, you can always sell it back to the market at what you bought it for. I mean, the risk is very low. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically if I just, you know, I have two things in mind is basically like risk a lot, but be very low risk in the way you do it. Yeah. It's a great point. I mean, if we talk about real estate as a whole, you know, what, what we do, you know, people who don't understand our business thinks it might be risky because, you know, who are your buyers for raw, raw land? What can you do with raw land? Everybody thinks in the terms of improving it and improving the value. So, you know, most other real estate, you know, I mean, we're buying, I mean, the number one rule in real estate period is you make your money on the buy. And that's why a lot of times I get more excited about a, a on the buy side than on the sales side. I like, getting paid, but I get excited knowing, Ooh, I'm going to make dough on this deal oh, for sure. uh, when I buy it. And, you know, so you, you look at, I mean, I, I flipped houses for a couple of years. And so, you know, a, you've got a lot of money at risk, uh, that you're typically borrowing and you're buying a little bit below market. You're forcing appreciation by fixing it up. And hoping that somebody will appreciate that and buy it at an appreciated value. Uh, there's all a lot of people when the market has been tight over the last couple of years because it's it's healed and, and on the upswing where, you know, they're paying retail for for something, scraping it or doing a major force in appreciation so much riskier, especially if the market takes a downturn. I have a buddy in California right now that's got uh, three ground up, two ground up builds and a, and a, um, and, and a, and a partial scrape. Uh, and he, his, his, his funding partners pulled out of the second round with the coronavirus. Hit. I don't know what he's going to do. He's probably going to go bankrupt. Yeah, there and, you go. So developers, just like you said, people think about what they can do with the land and everything. Developers are always at risk of going bankrupt if one if something goes wrong. House flippers, something goes wrong, something you didn't do in your due diligence, you can beat. So, like, I think that our business is still a risk, and you don't have to do anything. There's no none of the work that comes with developing something. Right. It's buying very low and reselling low. Although, and, oh. yeah. So although actually the next the, something that I am looking into doing is like, you know, that risk reward analysis seems to uh, tell me that a little bit of development will go a long way. Like if you buy a really big piece of land and you put some cheap roads that go through it or maybe. Yeah. So, I mean, just what did you say, Howard? Yeah. So you, so you buy a large, a large block of land. 
you got to do it in a county where it's going to be relatively easy to subdivide it. And then you plat it out into smaller properties. You put the road system in no more, no utilities or anything. Right. Yeah. And then you sell the individual platted properties. Yeah. Or you get, or do you or you do what I'm doing and get a deal with a guy to drill you 12 wells wells excuse me and you know he, you get economies of scale that way and the yeah. development risk so um, hey maybe one day I will be building mansions and subdivisions and I'll be looking back at this being like think about I mean just think of what you just the innovation the the creativity of what you just said you know the average person says okay I can call a drilling company. And, and I could figure out, okay, this is what I'm going to pay per foot times the number of feet I have to drill for a well. That's the retail price that they would have to pay. But you figure out a way to sort of buy in bulk, plat it out and sell it. And you're, you capture the premium between what you're going to pay on a wholesale level and what they would expect to pay on a retail level. But how many, I mean, Dave, how many people in the land business do you think are even thinking that way? You know, not a lot. Only, I mean, I think uh, uh, only people that have been in it a little little while and have the, the confidence and the wherewithal and the knowledge to do it. Um, so, you know, not 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 a lot because, there, there, you know, it adds a few more moving parts. And um, and so it's it adds a little bit more complexity. Our 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 core business model is about, you know, low hanging fruit and keeping it easy. But this is another thing, you know, when you start to get more experience, you get more confidence, uh, you're able to start exploring and, and, and uh, creating additional niches. And uh, Lucas is doing that. And that's exactly what is exactly right. And that's what I see. I mean, you're one by going into a more expensive kind of a proposition, you're creating distance between yourself and the mass of the land investing market, who is either from a capital perspective or from a confidence perspective is not there yet. You are adding a, a, a small modicum of value on top of it, but doing it in a really creative way. Uh, th- this to me is what an entrepreneur does. I mean, it says, look, at, I can take a couple of these resources and I can combine them in a unique way and offer them at a profit that's outsized compared to my costs. It's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that just comes with greater investment and greater risk, though. So, I mean, it is costing me a lot of money to do that. So, well, but it also sounds like you know, it's it's kind of migrating a business from high volume, low profit per deal, and in not I don't mean profit in an ROI way. I just mean pure dollar size to uh, fewer deals, but much larger, so that the profit per deal, you know, then can be significantly larger. Oh yeah. yeah. So it also that also comes back to the Pareto principle, you know. Uh, so you're you're maximizing a, a deal and making more off of less work. Um, but tell us a little bit, Luke, about um, you know in, in this new you know subdividing type of project, how important has uh, the land speed community been for you on that? Oh, it's been huge because, you know, I have been able to create some synergy with a few other members that are, you know, have a like-minded goal and, you know, go in with them. And so that's been great. And then on the other side of it, I've been able to find people who want to give us money to do that kind of thing too. So we're kind of getting into like other kind of stuff like, you know, Save me from myself right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we're not going to go into the details on that particular yeah. opportunity, but let's just say that uh, there are more creative options out there if you're willing to take a little bit of risk and yeah. uh, and invest a little bit more money and bring in some partners and the rest. And, yeah. Although for whoever is out there watching this thinking, I'll get in on the next time, you might be missing out on your one chance. That's what I'd have to say. <laughs> Is it just me or is it getting harder and harder to count on a job for our financial security? Who would have ever believed that we would go from the lowest unemployment in 50 years to 40 million people unemployed? Whether you have a great job and want to create a second income or you're recently unemployed, you need to check out land.mba, your one-stop shop for land investors. Investing in vacant land is a proven business model that can help you build a reliable and scalable second income. Imagine a business where you love what you do. 
There's no limit on how much money you can make. You can operate your business from anywhere in the world with an internet connection. And best of all, you can never be fired or downsized. If this sounds good to you, Land.MBA provides everything you need to get your business up and running and delivering income quickly. You get education, an end-to-end -end video course and optional coaching to help you get started faster and turn your energy into income. You get tools so you can automate and outsource the busy work and stay super organized. You get access to a thriving community of like-minded investors, which is a powerful way to share best practices and develop potential partnerships for growing your business. And finally, you get access to deal financing, so you never have to pass on a great investment opportunity due to limited funds. Our team has over a decade of real estate investing experience and has the knowledge and experience you need to help navigate any investing scenario. And with Land.MBA, we hold nothing back. Because there are no upsells, you get access to all of our combined knowledge right out of the gate. So don't wait to provide your family with financial freedom. Sign up today for Land.MBA's Soup to Nuts Land Investing Video Course. Just go to courses.land.mba and use coupon code FREEDOM to get 25% off. That's courses.land.mba and coupon code FREEDOM. And let us help you say goodbye to your J-O-B and hello to financial freedom. Well, we'll just leave that little bit of intrigue hanging out there. <laughs> All right, we're, 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 we, we only have so much time with Lucas, and I really want to get to the heart of the topic here today, which yes. was, um, uh, and, and we kind of gave away the punchline in the title, which is how you basically shape $4,000 off the purchase price of a property. And I'm going to lead the witness a little bit by asking you this question. What is your favorite business book? Oh, no doubt. Never split the difference. It's become like a cult like book between me and a few of my friends as well. And we're always, you know, I talk to everybody in, a, in the way that I am using some techniques I learned in that book now. I mean, if you can start asking people stuff like if you're having a conversation with them and you realize that you want to start saying less and listen more and you've got these three things looks like, sounds like, seems like to just keep on keeping going. Like people you're talking to, your friends, dates, people who are trying to sell you land, people who want to buy land, just keep talking. So like that's one trick. Those are some things I learned out of that book. But um, yeah, you want me to just get right into the thing we we're going to talk about on how I so saved 4000 bucks on the purchase of a property? Tell us the story. Absolutely. Right. So basically, I had this property that I was closing on and I was getting it for 15 to 15,200. And, uh, she had actually talked me, bid me up on my original offer. And I didn't like that. I was going up that high, although the property is worth much, much more than that. I just figured, you know, if I had an extra thousand dollars, imagine I could buy a new set of golf clubs, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> like, even if I can get a few hundred out of the deal, I think, oh, that's a, that's a nice pair of shoes or something. So like, I, I was thinking to myself, let's try and get this for a little bit cheaper. And it was right when the stock market started tanking. All the fear is at its highest point. So I just, she. From the she, virus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So um, basically uh, I could tell that she wanted to get the deal done because she had checked with me a couple of times about when closing was. So I was like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to close, but I just need a little bit more time. You know, I can't cash out my stocks to buy this when the market's so low. And then I just, one thing they teach you and never split the difference is negotiations could, should go very slowly. So I really took that to heart and I would take my time to email her back. And I would just like say, I need more time, more time, more time. And if you've ever been in the position where you really want something to close on a sale and you're, you know, you're selling a piece of land and somebody's dragging their feet all of a sudden, sometimes I'm willing to say, okay, just give me 5,000 less and let's walk away from this. So I knew that was probably that same kind of feeling was sinking in for my seller. So I waited a couple weeks of stalling, stalling, let's give me time to get money. And then I came back with a 4,000 lower offer. And, you know, it took a morning of back and forth email, but all then in the end, they ended up going for it. So, so, so one technique you did is you basically spaced out your, your communication. Oh, that was yes. one technique. And during the emails with her, I was obviously using never split the difference communication skills as well. Like, you know, 
statements of deference, like, I'm sorry that, you know, this is taking so long. I'm afraid that I might not have the money. Like those kind of things I definitely picked up from the book. Um, Do you remember what that was called in the book? It's uh, tactical empathy. I, I think that act, that part actually was the accusation audit. So you think about, okay, I'm going to try to lower the price or I'm going to take, I'm going to spread it out and take too long. And they're going to want to accuse me of whatever, right? So before they can accuse me, I'm going to basically defuse that by accusing myself. So it's like, I, I'm so sorry. You're going to think I'm a terrible business person, but I, you know, I just haven't been able to get all the, all of yeah. the, the funding together. And I'm afraid, you know, that uh, it's, it's taken a little bit longer than I would have expected. So I really apologize. And you take it all upon yourself and you diffuse it. Cause now what can they say? You've already, you've already hit all the points that they were going to make. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's what that is. So, so you did that now. Um, when you did that, I mean, how did you present it? I mean, so here's a woman you've, you've been now engaged with her in probably multiple communications over the course of a month or two. How did you present this idea of a $4,000 less uh, offer? Um, well, basically, I just explained that I was not able to get all the money, but I'd still really like to buy it. Would you, would you accept, I uh, would you accept, you know, 11 basically. So I, I use the, um, I can't remember what the fear of missing out term is they use in the book, but it's basically like, I think it's called loss aversion, but yeah. it was all of a sudden a, a choice between a lower price and no money at all. Right. Well, and, and timing issues like, you know, this, could, you know, I would take, I don't know how long it's going to take me to raise the balance of the money, but you know, if you really wanted to move, I could do it today for this amount of money. Cause it's what I, I can bring to the table. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much what I said. And right. I think that this, the reason I thought this would be a good thing to talk about is because this is going to work now and probably increasingly possible in the future. And it works. I mean, all these techniques work in every situation. I was yeah. talking to a friend of mine. He was paying like $122 for his Sirius XM satellite radio. And he got a message from them saying his price was going to go up to $322 or something like that. Yeah. And he's like, what should I do? I said, just send him a one line email that says, how am I supposed to do that? <laughs> <Yeah>. Sometimes <laughs> people take that. How am I supposed to do that thing? And just they're like, well, then here's how you do it. Yeah. But I yeah, mean, write a check. They get, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that, they, they might get it. They may get a snarky response, but I mean, you know, you just kind of follow up. It's like, no, no, I'm, I'm really serious. You know, yeah. how yeah, am I supposed okay. to do that? I remember once uh, few, when I first got that book, I was signing up for the gym and the, I was willing to pay the membership fee, but the, the sign up fee was like two months. It was like twice what the monthly fee was. And I was like, you know, I want to sign up, but how am I supposed to do that? I'm not, blah, blah, blah. I never paid the sign up fee. Nice. You know, it's, it's, it's a great lesson in many aspects of life. You know, if you don't ask the answers always no. you know? Right. So, I mean, I think a lot of people either don't think about asking or they're afraid to. And, uh, you know, you, you can, you can absolutely always get a little bit better deal on anything just about if you, uh, <laughs> deploy some of these techniques and there's, there's nothing wrong with it. You're not holding a gun to anybody's head. Yeah. So yeah, it was like yesterday, the day before a buyer asked me, so, I mean, the down payment was like $5,000 and she's like, so you know, how about no money down? And I was like, how am I supposed to do that? And then she just started like apologizing several times and, and saying like, you know, you, you just got to ask, you know, how are you supposed to know if you don't ask? I was like, I get you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I don't blame you. But we, we got to have to split but the I'm difference too. Ready with my defensive technique to that uh, power play. <laughs> yeah, yeah I get you. absolutely. So there's, yeah, there is a defensive uh, mechanism on that as well. You, you well, that is crazy cool. So, awesome. Basically, 
you shaved $4,000 off of the price of the property, chances are when you go to sell it, you're going to sell it for the same price you would have sold it no matter what you paid for it, because it's what the market will bear in the timing and what you negotiate. But no matter what you sell it for right now, you've just taken an extra $4,000 right to the bottom line, which is a lot of new pairs of shoes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, the shopping list would be immense, not just shoes. We're talking all kinds of goodies. Oh, yeah, man, you just can't gonna, go to the stores. You'll pay your entire camping bill this summer. <laughs> Actually, considering the fact that it's impossible to get a pull-up bar right now, you may put that entire $4,000 towards a pull-up bar. That's a good point. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Hey, you know, uh, I, I did that last week on a property, um, or two weeks ago, uh, I had a property that I was going back through my archives just to see, Hey, is there anything, any deals that, cause what I wanted to do was go back through all my nose. I'm actually still working on that deals that we didn't do. Cause we couldn't get uh, a good enough price. Cause I want to pop them a new letter and say, Hey, in light of the, uh, global situation going on right now, would you, uh, consider taking less at this point? Could you use some cash? Well, one guy, I, you know, I had his email. And I just popped him an email. I said, cause I noticed that we had, I just lost a deal. I mean, I, I, in, in the paperwork, in the shuffle, I just, I filed it wrong in my CRM and, um, and we had it, we had a signed purchase agreement for $3,500 or $3,000. And, but back in December, and we just forgot, we just lost it. And, um, the seller hasn't tried to call us back. So I shot him an email and said, Hey, enlighten the current situation. Sorry, by the way, it's been taking so much time. We'd still be interested in buying your property, but in light of the current situation, I can only pay you a thousand. Sure. He just wrote back and said, okay, fine. Let's do the deal. So, yeah. Yeah. You don't, you, ask, you don't get it, it. just dawned on me that you could probably have a strategy like that all the time where you're just like, always come back at somebody and renegotiate you know they they, re, they negotiate you up and then you take a little bit more time and then hit them back and be like you know what we're having a problem getting that money would you take this because even if their answer is no you just go right back to the original price you had so yeah i i always i always say this about negotiation is that you can ask for anything you want so long as you say it and make it sound reasonable and, and if you do that, there's three potential outcomes. They're either going to say yes, or they're going to say no, or they're going to come back with some counter offer. But yep. if you said it, if, if you built enough relationship and you said it in the, with this, you know, context of reasonability, they'll never walk away from the deal. Never. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Lucas, All I right. can't thank you enough for being on uh, on the show today. What a fabulous business you're building. And, uh, and and congratulations on uh, getting four thousand dollars off a single deal. I'm sure you'll be doing that on lots of deals going forward. Um, any uh, last words of wisdom for uh, for our listeners? I don't know. The only thing that comes to mind is go big or go home. <laughs> go big or go home. Sweet. I love it. Well, outstanding. It. Well, thanks again. Uh, if you like this, if you really liked this uh, podcast, we would love it if you would subscribe and give it a five star rating uh, so we can uh, increase our ratings on iTunes. Wherever you listen to uh, podcasts, please uh, check us out and, and do that. Subscribe iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Google Play. What am I missing, Dave? There's there's so many of them now. Well, you know, I think I think you got all those, but don't, also don't forget to check out Land.MBA, uh, responsible for the coaching of Mr. Lucas here, our big success. Draw. That's it. Set up a free 30-minute discovery session. Let's figure out what we might be able to do for you. Can we get you to your six figures in the first six months? Who knows? Let's talk about it. Thanks so much. We'll see you guys next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Had a bit of fun? and walked away with some actionable insights that you can apply to your business. Dave and I have got some great content and interviews planned, so don't forget to rate and review, and of course subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. If we mention any interesting links or tools, you'll find them in the show notes. To learn more about Land.MBA, visit our website at, wait for it, Land.MBA. See you next time on the Land.MBA podcast.